May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Flying back from the vacation I just took, I watched Top Gun Maverick on the plane. It begins with the pilot first breaking military protocol and then breaking records as he takes his plane past Mach 10. As he flew with the stirring beats of the film's theme in the background, I thought of another of my favorite movie themes, Vangelis' Chariots of Fire. I'm sure you all know it, but just in case you don't, we'll play a moment of it. Why are we so stirred by music and movies that soar like that? Music and movies and books and images that push us to imagine something more. Why do we love stories that are about breaking supposed human limits or defying them altogether, as in The Matrix or Marvel movies? Why do we have this ability to be inspired, to imagine more, to long for more? Most of us, are not going to fly Mach 10, or be an Eric Little from Chariots of Fire, or a Simone Biles. Most of us will not leave Earth's orbit and head out to space, but somehow we're stirred by the possibility, inspired by it. When I look at my own heart and figure out what stirs there when I watch these films, or watch amazing athletes, or hear Vangelis' extraordinary music, what I find there is not a longing so much for human greatness, not a longing to be amazed at something, or amazing at something, but a longing to believe that there is something more, that there is a kind of magic available to us that we taste but don't fully grasp when we see someone or something soar beyond what we believed was possible. I am reminded of what C.S. Lewis said in Mere Christianity. Creatures are not born with desires unless satisfaction for those desires exist. A baby feels hunger. Well, there is such a thing as food. A duckling wants water. Well, there is such a thing as water. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, that does not prove that the universe is a fraud. Probably earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it, but only to arouse it, to suggest the real thing. I must keep alive in myself the desire for my true country, which I shall not find till after death. I must not, never let it get snowed under or turned aside. I must make it the main object of life to press on to that other country and help others to do the same. I believe the reason I am so stirred by music and movies and athletic feats is because I am made for more than what this world can offer. They point me to something that I can taste now but not fully consume. I can sense but not fully grasp. Religions exist, as do so many other things, because humans have always sensed that there is more than what we can see and touch right in front of us. I believe that each of us, each person was made by a God of infinite love and made ultimately to be totally immersed in that divine love. We were made out of love. We were made for love. We are restless, sometimes more, sometimes less, as long as we are at all disconnected from that love for which we were made. We were indeed made for greatness each of us, and something in each of our hearts knows it and longs for it. But we push it aside. We try to dull it because the longing hurts too much. We chase it in the wrong places, and often we work to squelch it in ourselves or in others to deny their God-given dignity, the fact that they too were made from and for a heavenly love. C.S. Lewis calls it another country that we're made for. And in his wonderful Chronicles of Narnia, he imagines it as Aslan's country. Jesus calls it the kingdom of God. Throughout the Bible, the kingdom of God is a slippery concept. On the one hand, it's already here now in each of us, as the Gospel of Luke says. On the other hand, it is not yet. It is coming. And we are workers alongside God, growing the kingdom of God, sowing and harvesting. So what is this kingdom? 
For us, kingdoms are the stuff of fairy tales or history, more often than not run by villains or despots. At best, in most of our minds, they are part of a lesser form of government than democracy. But for Jesus' followers, the phrase kingdom of God would have rung with revolutionary power. It was nothing short of treasonous and impossibly hopeful that Jesus was pointing to and inviting his followers into a realm that was outside of Caesar's reign, to a king above Caesar, above the Roman emperor, who was meant to be obeyed and worshiped without question. And Jesus has taught them elsewhere that this kingdom is a kingdom where the first would be last and the last would be first. Whereas Ezekiel says, the mighty living trees are brought down and the small dying trees are made to flourish. Here, the little ones despised in Rome, non-citizens, children, women, the disabled, and even the ones despised by Jews, Samaritans and other Gentiles, for example. Here, in God's kingdom, all are welcomed. What a topsy-turvy kingdom this is. Jesus has given his followers a taste of the kingdom. He has brought them healing, hope, inclusion. He has empowered those who were considered worthless. He has fed the hungry and comforted the terrified. He has showed them what a kingdom run by God is like, and they long for it. So he begins to teach them more about what it is and how to bring it about. Each week, in some way or another, I urge us to do our part to build the kingdom. The beloved community, as Martin Luther King Jr. called it. But this week, we get a slightly different message from Jesus. Yes, we are to sow. We are to scatter the seeds. We are to do our part. But then there is grace. The Reverend Ann Sutterich puts it this way. Our job is not to make the plants grow. Our role is to sow the seeds, plant the seeds, tend them with faith, and rest in their provision. We do not know, and we do not need to know, how the plants will grow and flourish. We need to know that God will cause the sprigs to become mighty cedars. The theologian's almanac by the SALT Project sums it up like this. The seeds grow, whether within us or outside us, by God's grace alone. For any of us who are overburdened with worry about the future or who stress over the adequacy or inadequacy of our own efforts, this comes as consoling, reassuring, good news. This is good news indeed. And we do not even sow and plant and tend alone. Our reading from Ezekiel shows us a God who gets God's hands dirty, who gets down into the dirt to transplant and tra tend to the trees. This is a God who works, who gently tends to us and to our work. We may sow just a tiny, tiny seed, but then it will take over as a mustard plant does. It will multiply and be almost impossible to control not because of what we have done, but because it is growing in God's garden with God's grace and God's power. And what will it become? Both Ezekiel and Mark draw on the same image. The kingdom that we help to sow with our tiny, tiny seeds will become towering trees or bushes where winged creatures of every kind, not just like birds of a feather, will find shade and food and flourish. This is the beloved community indeed. This is the world we were meant for, my friends, a world of connection, of contentedness, of plenty, of abundance, of joy, of flight. But the discontent in our hearts, our restlessness tells us we are not there yet. We get glimpses every time we welcome the stranger, every time we repair a broken heart because we have welcomed in someone who is rejected by the church for their sexual orientation or gender identity, every time we surround someone who is grieving with love, every time we baptize a new baby, every time we feed someone who is hungry, every time there is a little piece of, there is in that moment a little piece of the kingdom of heaven shining right in our midst. Today we celebrate Juneteenth. Juneteenth is a holiday that commemorates the end of slavery in the United States. 
It recalls how the states of Louisiana and Texas heard the news that President Abraham Lincoln had signed the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1, 1863. But enslavement of human beings continued in those two states for more than two years after the proclamation was signed because the word had yet to travel there. Texas and Louisiana finally got the news on June 19, 1865. Formerly enslaved people broke out in spontaneous celebration. These were dangerous times. Even in the face of resistance and threat, the formerly enslaved Africans found ways to give voice to the wide range of thoughts and emotions at the announcement of the end of legalized slavery in the United States of America. In the church, it is appropriate to celebrate and honor the incredible resilience of those who survived such a brutal institution and worked so hard to resist and end it. It is also appropriate to reflect and repent. The church was complicit in creating the theological framework to justify slavery, and even today we know the legacy of racism is with us. In celebrating the end of slavery and the extraordinary work of so many to acknowledge and fight for the God-given dignity of every human being, we do get to see that little glimpse of the kingdom of heaven, even though there is so much work left to do. We each have a mustard seed that we are meant to plant. Juneteenth reminds us of what the world should be, a space of freedom, joy, opportunity, and abundance for all of God's people, for every one of us. So this Juneteenth, let's celebrate by taking the seeds God has given each one of us and sowing them. Let us water them. Let us tend to them. And let us rejoice that God's power and grace will, we know not how, take our every effort, no matter how minuscule, and grow it like that mustard bush that grows and grows and grows, spreading even into hostile areas where it is not welcome creating refuge and food for all of God's creatures to thrive. It is beautiful that today we also celebrate a baptism. Today we affirmed God's love for and welcome of this new little one, Olivia, into the family of God. And I love that we're hearing children's voices and children's feet and all of God's love for our children all over the place. Today, we affirm God's love for and welcome of this new little one into the family of God. We rejoiced in her beautiful life and had the privilege of being a part of such an important beginning for her. With water, with God's grace, with love, with light, we helped equip her to walk the path of faith and to live a life of joy, justice, and love and peace. Today, may we all remember our baptismal covenants. We are to live among God's faithful people, hear the word of God and share in the Lord's Supper, proclaim the good news of Christ through word and deed, serve all people following the example of Jesus, and strive for justice and peace in all the earth. Our hearts will stay restless until they have found their true homes in God, and until the kingdom of God, the beloved community, comes to full fruition. But each of us, like little Olivia, hi there, sitting up and smiling at me. We are each equipped with God's grace and love and power to sow the seeds we have and to be a part of God's work to gather together all of us of every color and creed, of every orientation, of every walk of life, like those winged birds of every kind. Then we shall soar, not just in a moment when we meet inspiration, but always and truly not just the privileged, not just the powerful, all of us. Let us use this Juneteenth to celebrate and honor those who have brought us so far in the fight for justice. Let us repent of the ways we deny the dignity of others, deny that they too are made to soar and know so much more. Let us together sow our seeds and marvel at God's grace that makes those seeds grow a thousandfold. Amen. <laughs>